It is October 18th, 2021. This is Rook. He is an Iranian-American tech visionary that learned computer coding on a Commodore 64 as a kid during the Iran-Iraq War. Today, Hadi Partovi has become one of the most influential voices in the tech sector. He came to America with little, went to Harvard, developed Internet Explorer, and has been an investor behind Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, Dropbox, SpaceX, and more. Today, he's the CEO and founder of Code.org, committed to making sure every student around the world gets a chance to learn computer science. A feature interview with Hadi Paratovi coming up. This is conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 151 of Rook. Sado Panjo Yek Reza Jun. Yes, yes, I know the numbers. I was making sure you understand the numbers. I don't know what they taught you in Shiraz. You know, I'm helping. The numbers. Trying to help. Just the numbers. <laughs> the numbers. You're a numbers man. I am, I'm pretty good with it. Nice to be talking to you, by which I mean the audience. Hope you are keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz, Durud Bashama, Hadi Parsovi. Speaking of, uh, you know, inspirational voices in our diaspora, um, this is someone who's been tremendously successful. One thing I think is, I was was reflecting on him and thinking as Iranians, we... we, uh, we too often tend to equate material success mm-hmm. with someone we should be lauding, right? Like, uh, he's multimillionaire, <laughs> Baba. Like, automatically, we should think the guy's great. You know, he has six Mercedes. <laughs> I don't know if that's true of Hadi. But, uh, um, but in this case, he's seemingly been really thoughtful about t- taking all of his success. You know, I mean, the guy was in his 20s working on literally developing Internet Explorer, you know, uh, and then investing behind Uber and Dropbox and all that. Um, And he's poured it into this project uh, that he's paying it forward with called Code.org, which is about uh, every kid, every student everywhere in the world learning computer science. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I'm going to ask him. Uh But... um, Oh, what an amazing project. What an amazing thing to get behind. Yeah, although I don't know what computer science is. The, exactly, it's like, you know, turn on computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think but his yeah, global it, education includes us, <laughs> teaching yeah, us yeah. what <laughs> computer science is, <laughs> since we don't even know what the term means. <laughs> but uh, I'm very, very happy to have uh, Hadi Parazovi coming up on this program uh, to get his insights to talk about like, just a, f- a couple of weeks ago he was meeting with uh, President Biden in the United wow. States presumably about tech and education and so uh, I'll ask him about that I'll ask him about his journey as from being a kid he's he's got a twin brother who he's also uh, who's also in the tech I mean he's, he's, his partner is his twin brother awesome. in code.org and yeah I think his name is Ali Hadi and Ali oh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll get to all of that with Hadi Parsovi. Looking forward to it. Hello, uh, Groovy Shaya. Nice Hi. to see your Hi, as, uh, sweet uh, face, your Surate Ziba. Her suit mm. face. Yeah. Oh yes, your first, you've <laughs> learned the word her suit, yes, which means course. hairy. Yes. And you indeed your face. I mean, you've just given up on shaving at this point. <laughs> kind you've of, given, yeah. It's just. I mean, the the beard is like yeah. at least two Khomeinis plus a <laughs> plus a Fu Manchu. Yeah, you know? Each day actually, it's getting harder to shave. You know, yeah. and I like it. You, know? you do. Yeah. What do you like about it? Uh, it gives me confident. You know, it really does. Good. Yeah. You feel like a, you're you're more competent, uh, confident, confident, and also competent, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, you're a more confident man because of your beard. Yes, I think so. Yeah, mm. I, I I think 
It raised my charisma. <laughs> <laughs> it, he's not lying. I gotta be honest. With you, you think it's raised his charisma? I think so. I don't think your charisma could raise any higher. As is that? Yeah, it's too. People I mean, the the bar was already too high. <laughs> uh, that's this is amazing. What a discovery! So by growing an extremely long beard, <laughs> we can elevate our charisma. In my case, yes. I think it's working for him. I really do, and I think his beard should have its own passport. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like it's it's on his own Twitter uh, feed. Yeah, his yeah. own Twitter account. Uh, hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, by the way, Keon. Yeah, where's our, Keon? Well, she is under the weather. Oh. Yeah, so we sending her our love. You know what? Um, you know what I did partly over the weekend. You How was your weekend, Captain Reza? Were you what? buying properties, buying and selling properties? <laughs> no, not yet. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I wasn't buying properties. Okay. I was spending time with family, friends. It was pretty good. I yeah. saw a picture with you and your parents. I did. I that did, was yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took him out uh, to Scarborough Bluff. Is uh, Scarborough Bluffs? Scarborough Bluffs. But you got. He suddenly got really Persian. I, I took I them did. to Scarborough Bluff. I have been hanging out. <laughs> and afterward, we went to Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks. Timorton. Scarborough Bluffs. <laughs> yeah. And then took him to Timorton. <laughs> <laughs> Zzz. Him or did you take both of them? Took thought, them. Yeah, 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 yeah okay, both of them. Right. Both of them. How was your weekend? Well, I was. Uh, it was fine. I spent a bunch of time, either wasted or productive, depending on how you see it, <laughs> finishing Squid Game. Oh. No way! Yeah, you the, the Netflix it, huh? sensation, which I'm sure many of people are listening, since it's number one in 90 countries around the world. <laughs> You know, uh, I mean, that's part of the lure of it now, right? It's like, mm-hmm. ah, I got to see what the big deal is. And so uh, now this Squid Game, I mean, <laughs> first of all, I enjoyed it. The reason I bring it up is because unbeknownst to you, Reza, uh, Shia and I spent about a, an hour phone call <laughs> no on way. Saturday morning discussing Squid Game. Are yeah. you serious? You guys we talked for an hour. It's like not, not uh, you know, oh, as if we don't get sure. enough of each other a year. <laughs> I was on the phone with Shia talking about Squid Game. Oh this is the Korean smash hit Netflix series, 10-part series, because Shia had said he's not so sure about Squid Game, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and I'll let you speak for yourself, Shia. But, but then, you know, he ended up watching the whole thing or much of it, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and I got really into it. And I, there, I mean, I think it's a good series. To I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's thought-provoking. There's things that I really like about it. There's things not so much. But two thoughts come to mind. One... Um, I find it exciting uh, as someone who can remember the world in a pre-super globalized era, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, which would be, be, I guess, pre-internet and all the migration uh, as much as it is today. Um, This, to me, is an example of a truly globalized world where where pop culture seamlessly crosses borders Mm -hmm. you know it's 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 no longer i mean it's not like this is brand new in the sense that there were people in south africa in the 80s or iran for that matter listening to michael jackson but that simultaneously everyone in the world can be watching a series that we're Mm -hmm. getting into and for the series to not be in english Mm -hmm. that's the other thing that is just kind of shocking but as as an immigrant you know it's it's so amazing to see it's an amazing to witness go wow like the whole world is captivated by this thing that isn't even in the lingua franca it's not in english which is so great and the part two of what really gets me about it is is an i guess it's an example of how all things asian uh, maybe specifically korean are really hot right now yeah like my my nephew is just anything bts anything korean they're in love with you know it's anything asian bts yeah i I mean much more than that so then i was thinking so there's the international component and do you know have you been watching squid game i I haven't been watching it but i know of it i know about it i know what the concept is what is right and for people who don't know what we're talking about it's not it's it's kind of like um uh, the Hunger Games, or it's like Survivor with a, a more dark twist to it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a, a futuristic, uh, kind of dystopian series about yeah. b- basically, you know, how we're headed towards the end of the world in a way, and capitalism gone amok, people, uh, class differences, etc. Right, Chai? Is that yes. pretty much yeah? Yes, yes. And uh, also, uh, I finished it last night, actually. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, I like it, but my problem with these kind of series is about some details in the script sometimes it's kind of a repetitive 
I, I like the games, the structure of the games, but I, I don't want. But to zoom spoil out. It. Don't. Wouldn't you rather people be watching this? I mean, it, notwithstanding the the violence, which we can argue is gratuitous or whatever. But wouldn't you rather somebody be watching something mind bending like this than just another Love dating Island. series yes. or something? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. And yeah. the fact that it's Korean. I mean, it's cool. Now, now here was my question: uh-huh. Would Squid Game be as successful if it were Iranian? If it were in Persian, if it were in Farsi. No, you know why? Because people wouldn't kill each other. They'd just be <laughs> like, <laughs> Don't talk to him. He owes me money still. <laughs> screw. <laughs> screw jab. I see. I just can't imagine. Unfortunately, I can't imagine. Even if it was just as well produced. Mm. I, and I invite people to, to comment, right? To us. Tell us what, you know, info at Rook Media. If you think, if you disagree. I just can't. I just don't think we have the the pop culture stock <laughs> no. you know i mean the you know there's a section of society western society or international society that gets that likes the persian films the art house films yeah. or the at least the Asghar Fahordi yes. or whatever you know but for for a real pop culture breakthrough mm-hmm. for that I, I just can't see it and it makes what, me kind of sad what do you think that missing element is for it to break through because think about it the two of the most popular TV shows in the last few years have been Money Heist Spanish show obviously it's not on an English show Squid Game Nomadland won best Oz, best yep, for Oscar, yep, best yep, Oscar, yep, and then yep. Parasite. So the the international content is breaking through yes. uh, within the mainstream media. Yes. But as you said, like Persian content, Middle Eastern content, really is not is not really breaking through and is not becoming mainstream. What do you think that missing well, element I, is? Well, I hate to say it, but I think it's not disconnected from the fact that, as polls show there continues mm. to be negative generalizations and stereotypes about Middle Eastern people, particularly right. Iranians. And so there's a negative view of Iranians that pervades uh, pop culture as well. And, and the proof is in the pudding, how this series will be a testament to how many things mm. Asian, uh, rightly so, greatly so, are considered positive now. Wow. I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment. You know, maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe we just haven't made the Squid Game yet, you know, and as soon as we do... Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe we should make it a new rock media show. That's coming right. Up. The Persian Squid Game. <laughs> Persian Squid Game. <laughs> I got an idea. Think Squid Game, but in Farsi. Uh, yeah. Not investing in that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, and CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and Persian, check us out on Telegram. All of our handles everywhere, Rook Media. And we would love you to become a patron of this program. We appreciate any support that you can offer to keep this thing going. Uh, We crowdfund, so... um If you go to our website, rookmedia.com, go to the top right-hand corner, you see a red button there that says support us. You can do so for as little as $5 a month, or you can make a major donation and help us out that way. Uh, Support us at rookmedia.com. If you're a regular listener, we really appreciate this. By the way, we've just uh, launched a new series on Thursdays called The Contemporary History of Iran. Mm -hmm. We're getting a bunch of letters about that. Uh, The first episode was from Shah Yod to Azadi. Uh, The last episode, of the Americans in the 1953 coup with uh, Stephen Kinzer. This Thursday... What do we got this Thursday? This Thursday, we have something related to somebody who just had a birthday. Oh. Who was that, Reza? Mm. Who's an iconic Iranian figure who just had a birthday? Uh, Ooh. uh, Reza hasn't been checking his social media. Maybe. (laughs) No. Close. Close (laughs) Close enough. Gugush. (laughs) The Shah Monu. The Shah Monu. Or Farah Diba. Farah Diba. Yeah. So this Thursday's episode is about Farah Diba's impact on arts and culture in Iran, Mm. particularly in the 1970s when she was quite young, but had a tremendous impact. And the person we're speaking to about that is Leila Diba a curator and professor uh not necessarily directly related but um oh i was gonna say name. is yeah. it like a cousin or a niece or something there's some relation but i don't think it's a direct one uh, so the contemporary history of iran part three this thursday and we invite you to check out part one and two that's currently up on all of our platforms my child excited. yes all right 
I should, thank you, Jai. <laughs> I should. I am feeling I have more charisma. <laughs> I have raised my charisma. Um, I, I should mention for this episode a big shout out to Farid Amerion and York National Realty for helping to bring this episode of Rook to your ears and eyes. York National Realty, a boutique real estate company based in Aurora, Canada. Uh, that provides top-tier service with its team of Farid, Sean Fadavi, and Nahal Sultani. They are a full-service realty firm that are there for everyone from first-time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Farid and team have also made it their mission to give back to the Iranian community in the diaspora and have supported a number of Persian community events and projects. If you are looking for real estate, especially in the new market in Aurora region, Ontario, Canada, this boutique firm is where you should go thank you to Farid Sean Nahal at York National Realty here's where you go on Instagram York National Realty that's on Instagram go to York National Realty one word hey in the coming days on Rook by the way uh, next Monday on our Rook episode we're going to do Persians teaching English whoa and then nice. we're going to do uh, Persians learning Korean so that we can watch, <laughs> watch, Squid, watch Game. Squid Game in its uh, original language. Actually, I've heard the, the, the dubbing is not that great. I haven't seen it again. But so you don't watch it dub, dude. I don't. I, don't, I haven't seen subtitles. it. Yeah, but in other hand, I've read some place that the subtitles are not correct. Yeah, change ah. the, the, the meaning the of the story. story. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. We see that sometimes with Persian films, you know. Yeah. Look at the subtitles going, that's not what they just said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you know, th- with the growth of English as the lingua franca around the world and the, you know, pop culture, all of what we've been talking about, um, the appetite for learning English has skyrocketed amongst Iranians in Iran and outside of Iran, obviously. And so there's been these folks in social media who've become, you know, rock stars by teaching English, you know, yeah. massive followings. So next Monday... Persians teaching is we're going to be joined by two of these online sensations. Uh, Shahzad Kazemi, who has a, a channel called Learning English with Sherry. I think she's based out of Vancouver. And Hu Shang, who's uh, got a, uh, a site called Hu Shang Academy. He's in the States, both of whom have big followings. Uh, and I, I'm going to ask him about, you know, what are the challenges uh, and who the audiences are for these uh, these massive followings that they have, where they you know sort of teach uh, idioms or teach grammar or teach words. That's amazing, man. Yeah. When 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 I moved here, like that. Well, there was certainly no internet on the phone. Like we had internet on computer and stuff, but it was such a drag trying to look up a word. Like I would see something and then I had to go home, open up a dictionary, look it up, or go to the library. Nowadays, just Instagram. And I was actually just showing Shia. Uh, I, I was blown away by this new feature on, well, it's not that new, on Google where you can take a picture of something and it'll pop, it'll tell you what it is, the name of it, the origins of it. Any, uh, like it, it just All of that anything. scares me. Yeah, really? It scares me. It excites me. Yeah. Wow. How so? Why? Why does this? Get I don't know. I mean, this is out of control. <laughs> yeah. You know, we take a picture and it'll tell you. Well, I, I, you know, I gave up on privacy long, long time ago. Oh, but, yeah. but this kind of stuff, it, it freaks me out. Uh, too bad we don't have a tech visionary coming up on the show. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to speak to you about these. No, I mean the whole Facebook nice. thing. I have to ask Hadi about that in a few mm-hmm. minutes. But, uh, but anyway, I mean these these. Uh, it is too bad, uh, Reza, for the sake of our show, that there weren't people to teach you to speak English uh, fifteen know. years ago better so that uh, it would uh, otherwise I would have known it's bluffs not bluff <laughs> I took them to Scarborough Bluff <laughs> and then we went to Estarbuck uh, you keep directing the show over there I'm, I'm trying my best Reza June this, and, uh, this ship is out of control and Ziba uh, Shaya Ziba. we'll talk to you on the other side let's uh, call up our guests here we go let's get to our featured guest you know there's no shortage of Iranians who've overcome adversity to find tremendous success in the world and in some cases those folks who have built their story with intellect, hard work, determination, independence. But even in that category, my featured guest today is extraordinary in terms of where he's come from, what he has accomplished, and how he is giving back. 
to the world. Hadi Partovi is an Iranian-American tech entrepreneur, investor, CEO, and co-founder of the education nonprofit Code.org. It's an organization that advocates computer science training for young people worldwide and provides coding curriculum for schools. So Hadi was born in Tehran and spent a childhood taking cover from the Iran-Iraq war. As an escape from their circumstances, as the story goes, Hadi and his twin brother Ali taught themselves to code with their Commodore 64 computer at home. This was a prophetic beginning, you might say, to what would become a highly successful career in technology. After immigrating to the United States, Hadi spent his summers working as a software engineer to help pay his way through high school and college. With all the education boxes checked off, he obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in computer science from Harvard. Hadi pursued his career in technology starting at Microsoft, where he rose into the executive ranks. As an entrepreneur, he was on the founding teams of Tell Me and I Like, and as an angel investor and startup advisor, Hadi was an early investor in a few little companies like Facebook, Uber, Dropbox, Airbnb, Indiegogo, and more. And right now, the CEO of Code.org, Hadi Partovi, joins me from Seattle, Washington today. Hello, sir. Hello, thank you. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be joining you. Uh, and thank you for that extremely generous introduction. Uh, I should add, by the way, that my twin brother shares almost half of the bio that you said. <laughs> He's an identical twin brother and is also true about him as well. Uh, I want to make sure he gets equal credit for things we've both done either together or life stories we've shared. I appreciate the shout out to Ali and I'm going to ask you about him because I, that in itself is remarkable, the way you guys, the trajectory of your lives and the parallels. Um, let me just start off with, I mean, you recently were invited to meet with President Biden about cybersecurity and technology. And I've seen pictures of you, Hadi, with uh, President Obama as well. Um, what, what is it like to be an Iranian kid who fled after the revolution and is now basically on speed dial, apparently, with the with the White House? Uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't characterize my relationship with the White House as being on speed dial, uh, but it, it was it has been really remarkable and unique. I'm not sure the the presidents or White House staffers I've met her met with have recognized how unique it is for me and how I feel to be in that position, uh, because it's both a position of privilege and honor. But it's also, you know, as an Iranian, we know in our history, a lot of things that have happened to our country have happened because of actions by you know, American administrations. So I have mixed feelings each time I, I have one of these kinds of encounters. Uh, but really what it reminds me and makes me think of is, I feel so fortunate to live a life that is consequential enough uh, to be relevant enough to be, to be invited to the White House uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, and it also reminds me that talent is everywhere and opportunity is not. Uh, you know, if I had spent my whole life growing up in Iran, I wouldn't have managed to have the opportunities that I have uh, thanks to having immigrated to the United States at the time that I did. And I think about all the students and children all over the world that are uh, that are talented and ambitious, but don't have the ability to, to, to tap into opportunity the way that I did. And just parenthetically, since it was only a few weeks ago, um, what, what did you make of Biden? So Biden. Uh, the event I got invited to was really special and unique for me. Uh, it wasn't just a meeting with the president. It was a meeting with the president, the heads of the largest technology companies, so the, the CEOs of Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, the heads of the largest investment banks like Jamie Dimon from, you know, the, all of these uh, leaders in industry. And I was there as a leader from education. Uh, and so, you know, and we were talking about basically different ways different industries can help with the national security problem we all face because of the cyber challenges, whether it's the technology companies who's, who protect our technology infrastructure, the banks that protect our money. And my role in education was to talk about how we can educate the cyber workforce of the future and help teach Americans to protect themselves online. Uh, most people don't realize that the vast majority of cyber hacks are successful because one person made one silly mistake. Hmm. And uh, oftentimes education is the actual key to that problem. So my work in education is uh, what got me the opportunity to join these people that are much more accomplished than I 
uh, to talk a little bit about the importance of school in helping to protect our country. It's a great answer, but you didn't tell us what you, what you thought of Biden. Did you like him? Was he nice to you? Uh, I, I, I'm just curious. Is um, I thought he was very likable. He was very much like what we see on on television, or or you know when you see examples of him. Um, you know, I spoke about the importance of education, and he immediately made a little uh, joke about watching his, I think, granddaughter or, or, or grandchildren with technology and how much easier it is for them and how, how natural it is their world and how important it is to make sure that every kid gets basically the, a level of education that he lacked, you know, when he was young uh, in terms of not just how to play with technology, but to understand it better. You know, speaking of tech heads, I feel like it's... um. Uh, in a way, it's auspicious timing to speak to you because, or, or fortuitous timing. And it, it's the 10 year anniversary right now of code.org, your uh, ed- educational nonprofit. And not coincidentally, the 10 year anniversary of the death of Steve Jobs. Um, t- tell me about the connection and how he inspired you. Sure. Um, it's, by the way, it's not the 10 year anniversary of me starting code.org is the 10 year anniversary of me deciding to start code.org ah okay okay because it took it took i think a few months more almost eight months more t- for me to actually create an organization i started laying the groundwork uh, but you know the day that steve jobs died was really meaningful to me he had been a almost lifelong role model as just a person i looked up to like what an incredible mind what a visionary he had lots of issues and problems but who doesn't but the, the way he impacted the world of technology and really just the entire world in such a short life was important. And meanwhile, I had always wanted to impact education. And the way I wanted to start was creating a video about the greatest of the greats in technology talking about the importance of computer science. Uh, and when Steve Jobs died, a number of things happened. First, I just thought of my own mortality. This guy was 16 years older than me. What's my mark going to be in 16 years? And then I wanted him to be in my video <laughs> and that wasn't an option anymore. And I was, and I, on a personal level, I missed him. But then what really kicked in is I saw this video about the think different campaign. And it was a video that he narrated talking about basically the video was dedicated to the crazy ones, the people who have the vision to change the world and the, the, the craziness really to try to make an impact. And, you know, his message was some people might think they changed the world, might think that they're crazy, but we think because they're crazy, they can change the world. And I remember thinking, am I crazy enough to actually start something with the vision of changing global education? It just seemed like a kind of an incredible thing to aim for. And I had for years wanted to, but I was scared. I was scared of failure. And I'd had enough success in my tech career to embark on an education career to change you know, the curriculum of public education, uh, it was a natural possibility of failing. And I just decided, screw it. If like this guy, you know, has changed the world, nobody told him that he can mm-hmm. or can't. He just decided to. By the way, uh, there's, there's there's poetry in the sense that you were, or you have been for, uh, for at least up until, you know, that point anyway, for most of your life, the, the Microsoft guy, not the, the Apple guy, right? <laughs> so yes. the love or the appreciation or, and the celebration of Steve Jobs is coming from the other side of the fence, which is, um, which I thought was interesting when I heard that story. Um, wh- why, why education? You know, I... Uh, it's not it's not abnormal for someone who's been very successful and someone who's a, an angel investor or or you know has that kind of clout to give back you know there's charities there's foundations um, you've made your life and I don't want you to uh, be modest about this because I think it's a beautiful thing you've you've made your life changing education i mean that's become your goal now for the last 10 years as opposed to um being a businessman i suppose uh, in the traditional sense uh, why why is has that been such so important to you that's a great question and the answer is very personal um and you know i've been lucky to have become successful enough as a businessman that i first of all have the chance to have this focus uh and i'm still part-timing it as a businessman uh but my full-time work is is on education. And the reason is my father, Firuz Partovi, which uh, many older Iranians may know him. Uh, he was the first professor at Sharif University, uh, and he basically hired the entire teaching staff of Sharif, which back then was called Aryameh, uh, and he ran the physics department. So he basically, he had already dedicated his life to education. And so being the, the son of a 
a physics professor and my dad and a computer scientist and my mom, uh, you know, like all Iranians have a sense of the importance of education, but having a father who basically helped create a university uh, gave me an extra dosage of, of really valuing education. And, you know, so many Iranian families left Iran in 1979 at the time of the revolution. And my extended family all left. People have often asked me, why did you stay? Uh, and I was six years old, so it wasn't my choice. But we stayed because my father believed that the university and the education system should stay strong mm. during a time of upheaval. And it was a major sacrifice, which my mom was not at all supportive of, to be honest. Uh, and there were lots of arguments like, betting as in, as in, like, let's leave. It's mm -hmm. dangerous. It's, mm -hmm. it's dangerous for our children. And my dad wanted to, to help Iran's education system. And so that left a very strong sense in me about the importance of education. And my success uh, has come really from my education, whether it was the, the informal education from my parents or the formal education I, I got by going to Harvard, the opportunities that I've had that have opened up to me because of my education are not available to most students. And the, the reality is even the best educated people in the world usually don't get a chance to learn computer science because it's not offered in their schools. So you could go to the best private school and then graduate from Oxford and never take a class in computer science because it's not on the menu. Uh, the vast majority of schools in the world don't teach computer science. Let me stop you there because, I, first of all, I want to get into the the story, and I love that you brought in your your father and your parents uh, because they're obviously such a significant part of of who and what you've become. But I just want to understand the terms, I, I, and forgive me for like a, a naive question, uh, as I often say, treat me like a six year old on this one. But what what is computer science? I mean, in other words, why should every kid be taught it, and how is it different from like knowing how to use a computer is that computer science or is is do i have to know how to program a computer or something that's a really great question to to make it very simple learning computer science goes beyond learning how to use technology it means learning how technology is created how to create it and to understand its societal impacts at a deeper level as a result so learning how it works and how to make it yourself uh, and Technology in this digital world is very broad. There's all these things from computer programming, making an app, making a website, machine learning, robotics. These are all cryptography, networks. They're all different aspects of digital technology. We use these things in our daily lives. So when you use an app, you know somebody made an app, but you don't know how it works on the inside. And the reason students should learn this, there's multiple reasons. One is just to know how the world works. Everybody in the audience that, that is listening to this probably learned how the digestive system works or how photosynthesis works, even if you don't decide to become a doctor or a botanist. Mm -hmm. You know photosynthesis helps make plants make sugar from light, and that's how fruits grow and so on. It's not because you want to get a job in it. It's just to be well-educated. And in today's world, understanding how an algorithm works or how an app works or what is machine learning uh, it's not just because you could get one of the highest paying jobs. It's because even if you want to become a doctor, the future of medicine is being changed by these mm. things. If you want to become a farmer, the future of farming is being changed by these things. There's really not any su subject or field of study or industry that isn't being changed by technology. And so if you're not... Sorry, sorry. Ex ex explain that to me. If you're a farmer or, or a guitarist or a plumber, uh, why, why does knowing how to make the computer, why is that important? In the, in the case of a farmer, farming is moving to self-driving tractors and drones monitoring the fields. And the farmers of tomorrow aren't going to be driving their tractor trailers. They're going to be actually coding them to say, you know, this is the area of the field and this is how the drone needs to monitor the crops. And people are making the tools easy enough to learn, but I guarantee you a student who learned ninth grade computer science will be a better farmer dealing with that. Hmm. And in fact, if you ask today's farmers, not just the farmers of the future, today's farmers in the United States, their top challenge is that the tractor technology they deal with is so complicated, they, needed to, they need to download patches and security updates, just like you and I need to download on our computers. And, and managing the software patching of their farming equipment is something that is uh, scary to them, just like managing your own computer might be scary. 
And so that, that is a very obvious example. Uh, if you're a guitarist, the future of promoting your music is right. changing to be digital. Right. Learning how to make your own website and promote it is going to be relevant. Right. But even the future of how you create the music is increasingly sort of not just playing on an analog device. There's, there's a lot of digital tools. Um, we are increasingly digital citizens. And uh, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to become an expert. Not, you know, everybody doesn't need to become a surgeon. But having the ninth grade biology level of understanding of what is right. even going on there right. is something that I think is important. And and just before we leave it and get to your story, uh, uh, you started something called Code.org. That's the organization. And then there was the Hour of Code. What is the Hour of Code that has become, um, uh, has grown tremendously in the last 10 years? That's a wonderful question to ask about the difference. So Code.org is an organization, a nonprofit founded with the vision that every student in every school should learn computer science. But the problem is why the number one reason schools don't teach computer science isn't because they're against it. It's they don't even understand it. They don't know what it is and they're scared of it because the, the adults are scared of it. They're like, I don't know what it is. I didn't learn that when I was young. I don't know which kids like that's probably for the geniuses and I can't teach it. You know, that's just their impression. Uh, and we needed a way to change the stereotype, to change change the dialogue so people realize I can teach it, my kids can learn it, and they're going to enjoy it more than they enjoy math class. And one hour is enough to get that message across. If any teacher in any city or country tries just one hour of coding with the right tools or curriculum, they'll realize that seven-year-old girls and boys love it. And they, as a teacher, suddenly feel like, wow, I just taught something I never learned in my classroom. So we created this campaign, this grassroots campaign, The Hour of Code. Uh, and it's that isn't just a campaign for Code.org. Anybody who cares about technical education can get behind it. And it's a it's really become almost like an Earth Day in schools, in that schools, hundreds of thousands of schools all across the world uh, celebrate something called Computer Science Education Week. And then do one hour of coding, basically to to plant a seed of change. Uh, and what ends up happening is after one hour, the kids say, "Can we do that again tomorrow or next week?" And the teachers are like, "Yeah, we have to do that. We can't say no to learning." Kids don't come in and say, "Can we do math again tomorrow?" That's not something anybody asks hmm. for, really. They do ask for computer science because they enjoy it because of the creativity, and so that is, has become our number one agent of change in schools. Okay, I want to come back to technology and, and, and ask a couple of philosophical questions around technology before we end off. But um, let me pick up on this this idea of who you are. Uh, I'm going to ask you in a moment about growing up in Tehran, but um, uh, I just think you, you know, you're doing so much that that kids today have to relate to. And I think, okay, then you have to relate to the kids and I mentioned your audience with the president. I mean, you're pretty much, if you know this, but you're described as a pretty big deal these days. You're the guy who helped create Internet Explorer. You're the angel investor from Facebook and Uber and Airbnb. You're rich. You're well-known. How, how much can you relate to the you of, uh, of 40 years ago, the Iranian kid who didn't have much when he arrived in America in the 80s? Um. First of all, when you said all the things I've accomplished, what what went through my mind is an Iranian joke that like my mom would be like, Vali inyeki doktor. I'm not a doktor. Hopefully. <laughs> we talk about that all the time, but you Vali maybe Reza Pezesk you know. But but yeah. you're but you're I mean, I don't think you're gonna get that from uh, parents. Yeah, I'm not I think gonna that, become a doctor. No, yeah. I mean I think you you the ship sailed when you went to Harvard. That's that's allowed. You're allowed to do everything anything after that, surely. It's funny because there's two extremes at which it's hard to relate to me. At one extreme, most people can't don't relate to somebody who's wealthy and made it at the level I have. At the other end, most people in the world don't relate to somebody who spent their evenings in a basement holding their ears while their neighborhood was getting bombed, or you know had to worry about his mother getting snatched off the streets and beaten because her head job fell off her head. Uh, both of those are extremes. Um, but there's so many things because I've lived through both extremes that I've had many experiences that lots of people relate to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming to a country as an immigrant is a story that many, many people mm -hmm. relate to, not just Iranians. 
uh, growing up, having to have clothes handed down to me from, you know, older members of the family or worrying that, you know, to go to a vacation happened only once a year and it didn't involve flying to a fancy resort and involved like a eight hour drive to stay in a very cheap hotel, but it was still the best thing ever yeah. because we've been looking forward to it. Those are life experiences that I think lots and lots of people resonate with. Uh, and because I built myself up from there, I think uh, it is easier for me to talk about the importance of opportunity rather than somebody who was born on third base and, you know, was already like living in the, a life of luxury and then also built a successful company or something. Like Let, let's go there. You were six years old when you and Ali, your twin brother, uh, were six years old when the revolution happened. Um, and you have described your childhood as, as very difficult in Iran. I mean, uh, many folks talk about this, but but you you guys were in an interesting location. I mean, you've talked about the 1,000 nights you had to spend in the basement avoiding bombs. Tell me about those days living next to a TV tower in Tehran, the implications of that. Sure. Um, first of all, we've now had some arguments because my brother says it was less than a thousand nights and different. <laughs> I've heard different things on Twitter about how many nights Tehran was bombed. So I'm not sure how many nights it was. For me, it sure as hell felt like a thousand nights. Uh, and, you know, many Iranians who lived during that time remember the Ajir Hermes, the red siren that would go off like, just this loud noise. And I, I I was young enough. I didn't know where the noise was even coming from. Was it on the radio? Was it on the TV? Or just was it blaring through the streets? But just when that sound came, you had like 30 seconds, I think, to just prepare the candles and kerosene lamps because all the power was going to be cut. And then it was just going to be darkness for the entire city. And basically, we'd go to the basement. Um, and for us, we lived a short walk and a walk that, you know, as a seven year old, I could walk to the TV station, sort of the park that was near the TV station, and we could see the t tall tower. Uh, and, you know, Iran at the time had, as I knew it, one TV channel. <laughs> like, as I remembered as a kid, and maybe again, my memory is wrong, but I, I didn't have 13 channels or like mm. 100 channels like today's kids have. There was one channel, right. and it was almost entirely propaganda. There were almost no good cartoons on it. Uh, and, Therefore, the enemy, the I Iraq, wanted to take out our communications. They wanted to take out the, the, the propaganda sourced for the country, the, the thing that was giving everybody their information, their news, telling them what's going on. Hitting, hitting the points of communication for government was important, so that, that was their target, and it was very close to our house. Um, what's interesting is I, at the time, didn't even re know what really was going on. I knew there was bombing. My parents were telling me it was the neighboring city that was getting bombed. Hmm. Uh, and I was not I was too young to recognize that we wouldn't hear it if, if it was in a different city, hmm. you know? Like, we wouldn't be holding our ears. And they would, would say to hold your ears uh, extra tight and that the best way to hold your ears tight is to also cover your eyes. Uh, and I didn't understand that that was not needed uh, if, if the nearby city was bombing out. So I was just holding my eyes and my ears uh, and that was, um, looking back on it later, I have more trauma than I did in the moment. In the moment, I remember, like, we would play, like, you know, when the bombs were gone, we'd just be sitting around with candles and, uh, you know, play little word games or voice games, or you, like, start a little poem, and the next person says the next thing, and then the next person says the next thing, and just inventing, you know, spoken word games amongst ourselves to keep ourselves entertained. Right. Uh, Speaking of propaganda, I mean, you talk about being a six, seven years old, a, a post-revolution, having to go to school, uh, I guess you're seven, you're eight years old, and, and scream death to America, death to America, um, uh, which, which isn't that extraordinary because we know that that's what, what kids had to do at the time. The, the interesting part is you talking about the fact that you, you would do it, but you wouldn't believe it. Um, and I, I love that in the sense that um, it says a lot about, I mean, for an adult, that's sort of understandable. They've got the context. You just talked about the context. You didn't know what's going on. Et cetera. But somehow you knew that this wasn't real, that you, you know, even though you were chanting the words, it wasn't um, something to buy into for you. How, do, how, does a, how did you avoid indoctrination, do you think? Um. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't, I, I would say because I was lucky to some extent. I was lucky that I had educated parents and I had visited America for actually two years. 
uh, while my mom was getting her master's in computer science. And so I had I had learned English before I came back to Iran in kindergarten. I was an unusual Iranian that my first day of kindergarten, I didn't speak the language. In Iran, as an Iranian boy, uh, I had come back to my home country and was learning. And I remember being scared entering kindergarten. And so I had loved the time we spent in America. And when the revolution happened, everybody I loved in my extended family, my Da'is, my Khalez, my aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody fun left to America. <laughs> so what I knew is I wanted to go be with the fun people uh, and not be bombed. Uh, and so when I was chanting death to America or stepping on the American flag at the entrance to our school, in, in the back of my mind, I knew I want I want to be there. That's where all my mm. my people, who my my family that I grew up with, are over there, uh, and I know they're not getting bombed. And and I knew my mom really wanted to go there. Uh, you know, I knew the cool movies that I couldn't watch came from there. <laughs> you know, and I think this is something many Iranians knew. But what was difficult is you didn't know who else felt that way, mm. uh, and you couldn't share that thought with anybody safely other than your parents uh, there was no sense of who might be either with the government or just against you <laughs> you know or you've actually said something very interesting uh, i thought this was quite inspired i mean it's it 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 gets my mind going you've said at 1980s iran i can't remember where you said this uh, if it was in social media or something but you said you were living through the ultimate extension of what today we call cancel culture uh, can you describe what you mean by that that's that's pretty funny. Yes. Uh, well, because you know today's cancel culture, people get canceled because basically they're no longer famous or they're no longer loved or they're people think oh they did something bad. But you know the ultimate extension of it, you I saw happen in Iran or you know Chinese people saw during the Cultural Revolution that happened uh, under Mao Zedong, where culture gets to such a point that the society enforces an ideology. And if you speak up against that ideology, you don't just get canceled because people speak negatively of you. You're taken to jail, you're disappeared, you're tortured, possibly killed. Uh, and that for sure happened to, to people. You know, I had a cousin who uh, was against the, the Islamic revolution and she marched in protest and then she was sent to Evin prison for like six or nine months. And she was only a few years older than me. Uh, and, you know, my mom would tell stories of other people who were disappeared. My, my dad's best friend got pulled off the street to because his name was the same as the name of somebody they wanted. Wow. And so just right. just for having the name as, uh, of somebody who was somebody else who was protesting, he was sent to prison for a year. And then he was let go a year later saying, sorry, we, we got the wrong Humayun, you know. Um, but yeah, Thanks. As, as, yeah, yeah. as an American or as a Westerner, we are so proud of the freedom of speech we enjoy and people are so worried about cancel culture. And I think that is really a good thing to be defending freedom of speech. When you actually don't have freedom of speech, democracy and all the freedoms we take for granted go down really quickly. Uh, speech is one of the first freedoms to, to, to lose. Once you lose your ability to criticize bad things, then things bad things just grow uh, and, and everything goes south. I'm with you, brother. I know that that we'll talk about that in a second with social media. But uh, let me let me just follow this through because it's such an interesting story. You're 10 years old when the arc of your life changes. Tell me about your dad bringing home a Commodore 64 computer and what that meant to you. Um, so I don't know, but I know if I was nine or ten, but I was roughly the age, uh, and he had brought it from Italy. Uh, so, first of all, it had like Italian manuals and <laughs> that I didn't know how to deal with it. It didn't have the right plug to go into the prise bar, like just getting it connected. And, and the computers at that time didn't have screens. So we needed to connect it to the home television and find the right wires for dealing with it. Uh, you know, it was just a, it was like a big, uh, big keyboard with, uh, that you needed to connect to all the things that you wanted to do with it. Um, but what it represented was, first of all, the future, like, because he said, this is the future, and I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, and he gave us a book on how to program it, because when you turned it on, it didn't do anything. It just had a little prompt, and you could type in it. Uh, but he said, if you read this book, you can get it to do all sorts of things. It can count. It can play games. It can play music. And we're like, how do we get it to do that? He's like, read the book and learn, learn to make it do that. Uh, and I think most kids, if you gave them that challenge today, 
they wouldn't do that because there'd be so many mo- so many more fun things to do in their life. Right. They could just go go play a game or right. whatever. Whereas in our life, there was nothing else fun to do. Uh, you know, you could go out and risk death and watch the tanks in the streets, or you could stay at home and and learn to get this this machine to count and play music and make games but it's still remarkable to me that that you guys as kids i mean as the story goes it's almost mythical you teach yourselves how to code i mean i can't my sister and i are pretty smart you know she ended up being she's a chair of a department at the university as a professor i can't imagine us teaching ourselves how to code on a computer as you know eight-year-olds or something how did that happen actually you'd be surprised how many people have a similar story of teaching themselves to code at maybe 12 years old. And what the reality is, folks who have never learned computer programming imagine that it is much harder. Hmm. They imagine that it is harder than calculus, you know? And you may have taken calculus in, in high school or college. Learning basic coding is way easier than calculus. It's, it's about as easy as like seventh grade math to get started hmm. or even fifth grade math. And you, when you went through seventh grade math, you didn't think, oh my God, I'm doing, you know, like simultaneous equations with X's and Y's. Right. But if you had never, ever tried that, and at your age, you learned about somebody who taught that to themselves when they were 10, it would blow your mind. But this is the 80s. Wasn't it a lot harder? That I mean, I, I figure it's probably a lot easier now, but back then... Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to uh, pretend that it was super easy, but it also wasn't like you know, rocket science either. But can I also say, is it ironic that you, in a way, I mean, given the work you do now, and and it's not necessarily as you described because you were from a, a super rich family, but that you had more opportunity with the respect to with respect to computers and technology in the in eighties Iran than many of the young people you're trying to help today by providing resources and training. Right? It's just you you had the computer. It's like get the computer, let them read the book. Is basically what your message is. Yes. Well, I had the computer. I had it, the computer wasn't enough. I had the motivation which was partly because I lived in such a terrible <laughs> environment that this was the only good thing. I also had a father who was a physicist and a mother who was a computer scientist. So, you know, my dad helped. If I would get stuck, he would be the person I'd go to. Right. Uh, I wouldn't say that he taught me, but I wouldn't say that I taught it with just a book and zero help. And most kids don't have a father who will bring them a computer, encourage them, help them when they get stuck. And so my parents were a very big part of that opportunity. Uh, And not that kids don't have parents, but just most kids don't have tech savvy parents because it's new and most of us aren't tech savvy. Uh, And that has been what has been unique to me. And and it's funny because when I came to America, my family was poor. You know, we couldn't couldn't afford a home. Uh, You know, I went to a really fancy private school on financial aid. So my brother and I were the the poor kids in the school who were the poor immigrants and every one of my classmates had like a Mercedes that was given to them from their parents. Uh, But if you look at the trajectory of my life, this computer and this knowledge has made a massive difference in where I ended up relative to where my high school classmates ended up. You know, I was going to ask about you coming to America because... Um, and, and not that your parents didn't have status and, and uh, you know, being the professor, the computer scientist, all of that, that um, that we would value in them. But uh, there is a tendency, Hadi, as you would imagine, to look at someone like you and just assume he was one of those Persian rich kids or rich kids that you just described uh, who, who had an upper hand somehow. How, how else could you have achieved such success? Your entire family, the four of you, your mom, dad, and your and Ali and you lived in one bedroom when you first came to the U.S.? I mean, uh, you, you lived quite modestly. How, what do you think you learned from that? Um, that's a great question. Um, first of all, my dad and mom had no status at all when we came to this country. Uh, you know, my dad had helped start a university in Iran, but uh, because of his immigration status and because he hadn't been published recently in American universities, he couldn't get basically a job as a professor in america he started working in in administration at mit and harvard and had a much lower status than he enjoyed in iran Uh, and in fact he had to work in boston while we lived in new york and he'd drive back and forth 200 miles multiple times a week just to see his family while making money Uh, my mom worked as a secretary by day 
and a, as a department store salesperson selling clothing at night. Uh, and she has a you know master's in computer science, which you know in this day and age, a woman with a master's in computer science can easily get employed. But being an immigrant from Iran during the 1980s, right. that that was not what basically it was. They had no status. Uh, my extended family in parts of the world had status. My mom's family, the Khosrow Shahis, uh, those members of the family who had gone to Europe had managed to bring more of their money out of Iran. Uh, but my grandparents and my parents had none, and we. We grew up uh, for the first few years, there was a bedroom in my grandparents' house. Uh, and not only we shared one bedroom, there was two twin beds joined together <laughs> for the four of us. Uh, and so I remember in seventh or eighth grade, like I couldn't bring friends home because there wasn't a home. And I would be embarrassed to show them my bedroom because it wasn't my bedroom. It was like my mom's clothes <laughs> were in it with my dad's clothes. Uh, and I remember growing up with my brother and I would fight every night about who gets to sleep on the side of the bed, because if you're in the middle, you'd fall in the crack between the two twin beds uh, and be squeezed between all these people. Um, so, I mean, the, so, the expectation or the or the um, the the romance to a certain extent or, or is to say that teaches you who you are to value material things um how life isn't easy how to overcome adversity was that all true for you or is that is all of that a bit of a a romance it's actually absolutely true for me um you know there's lots of things i would say that i'm humble about but one thing i'm very proud about is having been grounded in just reality of seeing difficulty in life and seeing it juxtaposed with really great things. Like I went through the tough life in, during the Iranian revolution, but I had visited America. And then when I came back to America, I lived through basically a relatively low income childhood, but I was going to school with these very wealthy kids. And so I both, I actually knew what I was missing. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that gave me not only a sense of, of resilience and ability to overcome adversity, but also a sense of motivation of, I want to get to where those other kids are, or I—I mm. I knew where I wanted to get to. How do you um, think? How do you think it manifests itself in your work today? I mean, if I, I don't know if you can even answer this, but do you, do you think? I mean, for example, do, does it lead you to have more patience with people who have a startup, or or do you? How, how do you actually put those lessons that you've learned into practice in the way you deal with people? Gosh, that's a really good question. I didn't expect such. Uh, thoughtful questions. Um, first of all, not a day goes by that I don't just in, just think how lucky I am to live the life I've been living. Like to get to go to the White House and meet multiple presidents, you know, given where I started or just to have food every day. Like when I buy something on Amazon and I can click buy and I don't worry about how much money it is or can we afford one? You know, most people don't have the luxury I have. And I, I feel blessed and just knowing that i feel blessed is a great thing it, it makes you a happier person so many people who are, are successful aren't happy uh, the other thing in terms of my investing work as an investor i look for entrepreneurs who have an intrinsic drive for some reason because the hardest challenge with our entrepreneurship is persistence and sticking through failure and you need to have something that's driving you. and it, different things drive different people so it doesn't need to be the same but that's something I look for. Uh, and then in my work at code.org, uh, it brings meaning to why I'm helping teach computer science. It's not just to help people become coders. It's to help students and children have a pathway of opportunity. Because like I said at the beginning, talent is everywhere and opportunity is not. And uh, there's so many kids who could have the path I had, but they don't have the father I had to, to guide them on, on to what things to learn. And their, their school should give them that preparation. And when schools don't even teach computer science, because there's no teachers in the school who think that it's real and the system doesn't put it in as part of the curriculum, kids just get left behind. Uh, and and addressing that so that no kid gets left behind that way is, is what brings meaning to my work. That was a great answer. And as much as that seemed to be off the top of your head, that was... Uh, that, that's that's exactly what I was looking for in terms of the how how it manifests. It makes a lot of sense. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, the period between 
you know, arriving and going to school and, and then where you've got to now. And I, I'm talking about the 1990s. I mean, you go to Harvard, then you end up being on the front lines of creating Internet Explorer, as one does. <laughs> this is in the, in the 90s. Do you, do you look back at that era fondly as or I mean, or marvel at how naive the world was about where technology would end up uh, 20 years later? Um, I look at it fondly, but it's also just incredible having seen 20 something years later how much the world has changed from technology. But I was lucky not only to go to Harvard, but to graduate Harvard basically at the dawn of the, the World Wide Web as we know it. So th the year I graduated was just a perfect time for, for somebody who had studied computer science. Science. It was just this explosion of the, the coming of age of the PC and the the birth of the World Wide Web and, uh, you know, joining the Internet Explorer team, I wasn't, uh, you know, they were so desperate to have good people that it wasn't just that I was lucky to be on that team. They were like, oh, my God, we need you and we need as many more people as we can. So it was I was at the right place at the right time in a really great way. Uh, and it's sad because Internet Explorer now is just a sad joke. It's it's such bad technology that Microsoft itself canceled it. Uh, at the time when I was building Internet Explorer, uh, well, to, it started off as a sad joke too, but basically the, the work we did built it up from 1% market share to you know dominant market share as the number one best web browser that everybody was using to connect to this magical internet. Uh, and then Firefox and Chrome came along and Microsoft stopped paying attention to the, to the web uh, and to the web browser and then Internet Explorer just basically declined. But, but the years that I was there, were very foundational for me. I learned not only how to manage teams, how to manage products, how to build great technology, uh, but I also learned that I wanted more purpose in the work that I did. Uh, and you know, it brought me purpose that I'm creating a tool that millions of people, hundreds of millions of people were using to discover the internet for the first time. Uh, but it also brought me sort of lack of meaning to recognize that also what I was doing was helping crush a competitor, you know, the small startup Netscape that had popularized the Netscape web browser. Right. And I, I didn't feel good about that part. That didn't make me, didn't bring meaning to my life. Uh, and so I, I wanted, I realized that, you know, the technology I build has global impact, you know, as a, as a 25 year old, I was building something that hundreds of millions of people were using. And it made me start thinking about, okay, if I can have that type of personal impact, what is its what is it going to mean later on? Perfect. Uh, That's a perfect segue because I, I said I wanted to come back to technology and, and ask a couple of, I mean, quasi-philosophical questions about it. But uh, you, you've been a big proponent of technology and technology is awesome. And I, I, I don't want to, I'm not necessarily when I'm saying technology referencing, you know, the, the thing that helps the, our air conditioning in our house or, or a surgeon do their work in a hospital. But, but in terms of the gadgets that we carry around in our pockets and the screens, and uh, I mean, technology uh, is increasingly the cause of, we are told by multiple studies over and over again, loneliness, depression, suicide, shaming, uh, you know, a Manichaean world where everything and everyone is seen in black and white or good and bad. Um, how do we contend with that? How do we love technology and know what's happening in terms of the toxicity of it at the same time? Uh, this is a deep question. And first of all, I'm I'm not the only person with an answer. Everybody has their own answers on it. Um, it's funny. The philosopher Yuval Hariri ha has proposed that man was mankind was at its happiest when we were hunters and gatherers before we domesticated plants and invented farming, yeah. <laughs> which was yeah. probably our first among our first technological inventions after basic stone tools and fire, uh, and that we were happiest then. And the history of mankind since then has been to invent technology that on the one hand makes our lives more productive and more convenient and supports a larger population and on the other side reduces some freedom or makes a slave to the tools that we've built or destroys jobs or things like this yeah the, it's many of the issues we're dealing with with technology today have always are repeated issues you know technology that automates jobs is a is something that has happened throughout the history of mankind uh, technology that people are scared of because of its impact has been the case since, you know, 
all time, whether it's the invention of the steam engine, the printing press, all of these things have pros and cons. Um, you know, the way I would say about it is, first of all, I'm proud of us as humanity, as a race to have come from caves to now invent the things we're inventing. But these things that we're inventing can be used for good or for bad. Uh, you know, just like nuclear, uh, the nuclear inventions of Einstein can make bombs and they can make cheap, clean electricity. Mm -hmm. right, right. Uh, software technology also it's not just a question of what could you do but what should you do and in fact uh, this is part of what one of the reasons code.org is important to me the work i do in terms of education is to make sure that computer science classes teach students to think about the societal impacts of technology and that's also something that i think belongs as something every kid learns not just the ones who become the future coders right, right. But I, I mean, I like I almost want to say, uh, learn the computer science. But at the same time, don't go on Twitter and see white nationalist stuff and body shaming. I mean, I, I don't know uh, how you navigate yeah. that. You know? Yeah. And social media, especially right now, is sort of the tip of the spear of what people complain about or are worried about from from a standpoint of technology. Uh, but there are many other risks or potential downsides. And one of the things we need to recognize is that technology is an amplifier. It amplifies our own instincts as humans. Uh, you know, humans invented war, but then they can use technology to make bigger work tools for worse wars. And, you know, as humans, we're not perfect, especially as societies, we're not perfect. Uh, and so social media can bring out the best in us and it can, can bring out the worst in us. Uh, and it's always difficult to figure out what is the right way to do this stuff. Um, but what I'm sure about is as we teach students computer science, we should teach them to think about the societal expectations and societal implications, whether they're the ones becoming the coders or the ones becoming the voters, uh, they should have an understanding about this stuff. So speaking of uh, social media, you were an early investor in Facebook, uh, and, and I'm not going to ask you about the details of how you feel about you know, uh, what people have said about Facebook or the back, what, what happened in the back rooms or decisions that were made. But I do want to ask you on a general level, like we know how big a deal Facebook has become, but it has gone from, um, you know, a benevolent way to stay in touch with your ex from high school uh, to what many see as this evil instigator of much of the misinformation and polarization our world faces today. Um, you know, we come from a country, our ancestry, where a revolution went wrong, you know, in the eyes of many of us today. It was a popular revolution, right? And it didn't work out the way we wanted it. What, what do you do when a company you have worked with or invested in or, or hoped for does not end up being everything you wanted? Uh, I should first of all say when I, you know, I was lucky to have met Mark Zuckerberg when he was 21 years old. Uh, and that was for sure being at the right place at the right time. Uh, and at that time, nobody envisioned today's Facebook. There were no sort of backroom decisions then around some evil plan to control the flow of information or impact elections or things like that. Uh, his vision was around connecting people to bring people closer together, uh, to provide sort of the backbone of how personal identity is defined on the internet. Uh, and I would say very much a well-meaning, well-intentioned vision, but also very bold and big vision. I don't think anybody at the time could have imagined the level of influence, impact, power for good or bad that Facebook has. And I think many of the last few years, Facebook has just been playing catch up with uh, imp impacts that it didn't predict. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problems it's trying to solve aren't just Facebook's, you know, um, one joke I made once is Facebook is, has a challenge of trying to cure human nature disorder. Uh, you know, Facebook isn't alone. Uh, communication mediums and publication mediums often bring out the worst in us. Uh, and, you know, that's not, if Facebook didn't do it, Twitter would be doing it. And if right. Twitter wasn't doing it, so like, <laughs> you know, it's not any one organization. And yet Facebook, by being the largest, has both more resources and as and more responsibility to do better uh, do you end up personally lamenting it though do you go hey boba john cherry and Kodak, why why did i put money into this thing or why i mean do you or, or 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 do you go there i mean in your in your own mind at all um i don't but maybe that's because i'm rationalizing and feeling okay about myself but the reality is you know i put my money in when it was a pretty small company right. and i took it out 
soon after the IPO, uh, long before any of these issues. So uh, there was no point of time there that I thought this is a terrible company. And in fact, I thought it was a great company. And these are these are people inventing, you know, future highly important technology. Right. Uh, right now, when I look at it, there's many things I would do different. And there's times that I've written Mark and, and given him suggestions for things I'd do different. I'm not the type to try to make public noise and bash anybody or anything. You know, the, you can get very popular throwing stones at other groups and bashing people for doing things the wrong way. Uh, and I get critics doing that to me. Um, but I, I prefer to stay focused on either doing good myself or applauding people who are doing good. And, and I'd rather be less popular, but keep my my public words to be positive. Uh, but I have shared privately thoughts with either Mark or Sheryl Sandberg about things they could do differently. To be fair, everyone has changed their mind. I mean, is, is, I mean, I, I remember literally probably 12, 15, 14, 15 years ago, proposing something when I was um, working at the CBC at the network saying, what if we did a, a special called, is Facebook really good for you? You know, um, and, and at the time it was a big question, you know, it was almost like a, a very outlandish question to ask, you know, a very cynical question because who, you know, nobody thought well, what's wrong with Facebook. I mean, it's, you know, where I go and, and see old pictures of my friends or whatever. So it's clearly evolved and, and um, uh, become maybe a runaway train in some ways uh, i appreciate everything you've just said um, um by the way also isn't just facebook you know right what should the rules be for social media and especially as iranians since we recognize the importance of freedom of speech like it's a tough problem to solve uh, it's it's not just one company's fault uh, and how to solve it by regulating speech is not simple yes at all yes uh, let me let me end off with a couple of personal questions. Uh, um, I, I wanted to come back to your twin brother, uh, Ali, who not only is he's an identical twin, right? You guys are like yes. twin twins, uh, uh, who's also been your business partner. I mean, he's the co-founder of, of Code.org. Uh, I, I always think these things with twins are so interesting to me. I mean, are you guys, you're clearly ambitious. Nobody does all the things you've ever done in your life without being an ambitious person and a very focused and directed person. How competitive are you? And and why didn't one of you go into music or medicine? I mean, you both literally have uh, trod the same path. It's very curious. Tell me about you and Ali. So first of all, I would say our, we, we are competitive, but I think in a good way. I remember always growing up that uh, you know, most ambitious people are compete with themselves. Like I can do this, but then I could do better and then I could do better. But when you have a genetic identical version of yourself, <laughs> if I would compete with him, it's because obviously if he can do it, I should be able to also, you know, because there's not a single thing he's got since birth that I didn't have. And so it would be more, you know, he would learn a song on the piano that I didn't think I could learn, but if he learned it, I can definitely do it. And it'll make me think I can learn an even harder song, you know, uh, or when he started his first startup and it was successful and he sold it for a lot of money. I was like, wow, obviously I could do that too. And it wasn't because I wanted to beat him. It was because he had clearly showed that that's something one of us can do. So I, I want to also be able to do it. Uh, and I would, I think that's a relatively healthy competition. Um, but I would also say siblings also have tensions. We've had tensions between us many times throughout our life. I don't want to pretend that it's just been like, oh, everything has been positive with nothing bad. Uh, but we will always be brothers. Uh, and so that and just the life stories we've shared, much of what we just discussed has been not just my story, but also his story. Uh, it's a very unique to have to have shared something like that with somebody in that. So that's going to have a bond between us that is pretty unbreakable. My sister is probably the only person in the world who can, you know, get me with just a look you know, who yep. can just uh, uh, antagonize me or win me over or whatever with just a one little look of the eye. I can just imagine the connection between you two, the symbiosis and the energy is is through the roof, both in a good and bad way. I mean, it's it's amazing that you do all these things together. Um, let me finish. You, you've talked about being an Iranian who has led the American dream. Tell me how you identify the American dream today. Sure. Um you know, I say I'm an example of the, somebody who's living the American dream. I don't, wouldn't say I've led it, but I've lived it. 
Uh, and, you know, I would say America is a country, but America is even more than a country. It's an idea. Uh, America just stands, I think, globally as, an, as the idea that people should have freedom, equality of opportunity, uh, and the chance to build some, a better life for yourself. Uh, you know, the, the American ideals may not even always be held to in our country, in the country that I'm living in, but they're ideas that have inspired the entire world. And to me, the American dream is something that I had read about when I was in Iran. The idea that you could be poor, but work hard, work smart, and build not only a living for yourself, but to, you know, live a very comfortable life and you did it yourself uh, is is a powerful idea that lots and lots of people want either for themselves or for their children. Uh, and part of why I started Code.org is I realized that at least in America, that, that dream is not working out for lots of people. There's lots of people who are working hard, are learning the things that school is telling them they should learn, and then they graduate and they're full of debt and they don't see how they're going to make it. And, and there isn't a path that works for anybody in their neighborhood, uh, and they don't see anybody who's made it. And it feels like the, the, the pathways to the middle class or out of the middle class, or none of it feels like it's working anymore. Uh, and part of my motivation for starting Code.org is I know that in computer science, there's a pathway that totally works. If you get really good at computer science, the sky's the limit, uh, not just right now, but for the next 50 years or longer, this is a subject area that's that's going to be changing our world, an opportunity not just to make money, but to also make impact, to leave a footprint, to invent the future of humanity. Uh, and so I believe that all, every school should make that possible for students. It's great to talk to you, man. A final question. When are you starting your cover band featuring the music of The Cure? <laughs> wow, I did not expect that question. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm in a family. My brother and I, at the same, roughly the same time, we taught ourselves coding. We also taught ourselves to play the piano, and we both play piano and guitar. And I've now, uh, I don't have a cover band. My my own family, my kids and I have started a band. Uh, over the pandemic, we started a band called the Quarantinis because while we were in quarantine, my eldest son learned the, the, the piano and my youngest son learned the guitar. Uh, and so we're, we basically play lots of different songs and The Cure and, and Coldplay are probably the two bands we like to cover. I, I just love that you're teaching them uh, new romantic, uh, new wave music from the early 80s uh, with a lot of eyeliner and hair gel. I love that. Yeah, I have an eight-year-old who loves U2 and The Cure. It's pretty funny. It's brilliant. Um, Hadi Paratovi, Khaili, Khaili Mochakaram, I really appreciate uh, the time you've taken with us today, your insights, and um, shedding some light on, on, the, on your story. And I think it'll be instructive for a lot of people. Thank you for this, and thank you for the work you do around education. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful pleasure talking to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hadi Paratovi, an Iranian-American tech entrepreneur, investor, CEO, and the co-founder of the education nonprofit Code.org. Hadi joined us from Seattle, Washington today. Microphone's back on for Groovy Shy and Captain Reza. Wow. I, I, uh, that's got to be one of my favorite interviews we've done on uh, oh, Rook. Yes. I really enjoyed that. Y yeah, me too. Uh, I loved it. Huh. What'd really you love about it, Reza? Well, I. You can relate to him, I guess, as, I a, as a super <laughs> successful. <laughs> I joke. Yeah. No, yeah, but honestly, like he's, he, if, like you see, this is an Iranian I'm proud of. I'm proud, um, and again, going back to the debate of being pr like the pride versus happiness and all that, I'm happy to call myself an Iranian, but mm -hmm. I'm proud of an Iranian like him who's, who's truly like made, uh, made a difference and is making a difference. And in fact, uh, I just sent, um, I looked up his uh, code.org and I sent the, sent the website to my girlfriend because her son is a genius, super genius in computers and coding. And I want to, I want to look into like try to register him for his school. It's, it's fabulous. It's mm, amazing. Uh, nice. Yeah. 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 Nice. Shia. <laughs> uh, well, 
what can I say? I mean, all the twin people are genius, but this one is really <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, genius. giving yourself credit. <laughs> yeah, no, what? All the which people are genius? Twins. Twins, twins. oh. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, twin. actually, <laughs> I, I remember, I, I know that we also in my house, in our house, wh- when we were a child, we were playing with Commodore Shasta Char, uh, Commodore 64, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did, you didn't happen to learn coding. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. I like he's like, I, I love that Hadi was just like, uh, you know, I mean, there was nothing else to do. So we became <laughs> computer geniuses. It's like, uh, I can think of a lot of kids who didn't, you know, also had nothing to do, but didn't yeah. actually follow that path somehow. Yeah. yeah. There's three of us in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing drums. Res- uh-huh. I had things to do. <laughs> I tried a drum kit to play. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I mean the path that he he's gone through it. I I'm fascinated by that. He w- when he was kid, especially he wasn't you know rich and calm life. He was in the war, and mm-hmm. then when they moved to United States, they live in the modestly. Ru- mo- yeah, yeah. yeah, and that that's really fascinating because maybe people thought that oh, no, in yeah, he's a rich kid that you know, but no, he's a genius. He built his yeah. own path and i really yeah yeah and i i think i mean i believe him when he says that he he learned from that he he part of who he is is the guy who came with nothing so uh it's a bit like uh, ali parso you know these guys who who um are i i have a more um I have more confidence that they can relate to uh, those of us who, you know, are not uh, um, superstars of, of tech or material wealth or whatever, because they've been there. They've been there. You know, they've been. Uh, he he didn't just have a silver spoon his uh, entire life. You know that expression, right? No. So the expression is uh, to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth it means to be silver born. Silver spoon to m- be means born. you're wealthy. Oh, means uh-huh. you're rich kid. You know. Yeah. Um, I only said, do, do you know that? Because you were looking at me blankly. Mr. <laughs> Barre, you were looking at me. What's <laughs> 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 a chen, chenge? Chenge? Chenge is chenge. the oh. meat. That's oh, a piece of <laughs> meat. <laughs> right. Sorry. You don't like it. I was trying to get the, I always get, is it Barre or Chenge? Or which one we say when we, we, he's looking at me like a goat? What was that debate we were having we in were, uh, England? What, we were, it was about what, what to call a goat. Oh. Oh yeah. no, goat or, or sheep? sheep? Sheep, sheep, sheep or lamb? Yeah, Which one is lamb, lamb. What to call a lamb? Yeah, we said, and it was. I was confused because I thought chenje referred to. I, I didn't know it was just a g- generic term for meat. I thought yeah. it was like it referred to the animal. So I was like, how many titles does these animals <laughs> have? A <Yeah>. lot, yeah. <laughs> No, but I think it was uh, like lamb was the meat of the sheep. <laughs> Who was our guest again? <laughs> Doesn't take a lot for us. Like, Adi John, if you're still listening <laughs> yeah. to the interview, please please turn it off. My Adi. apologies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, do do you think who is more powerful, like Biden or um, someone like Z- Zuckerberg? Zuckerberg? Yes, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg mm. is more powerful. I think that's the what everybody's so f- afraid of. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah, these guys. Are, I mean, they, they, those platforms are shaping our minds, yeah. right? When he was talking about how he decides who he wants to invest in, mm-hmm. and uh, I loved that his the criterion, or at least is the main criterion that he he told us about was persistence, and somebody who has an incentive to to stay persistent, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in his case, it might have been a material incentive, you know, coming from not not having a lot. But mm-hmm. but I thought that was really interesting. That was an interesting insight. It's not necessarily the idea. It's not necessarily that you know. It's it's mm-hmm. it's that the person has the incentive to want to be persistent to keep going. You know, I thought that was very telling. You know how to say persistence in Farsi? Chenje. Bukalamun. Afarin. Na, Jian Jian. Pushtekar. Push the car. Okay. Push the car. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That's a man push the car has to. No, man push the car daughter. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Two years after. <laughs> well, that's a tough <laughs> one. I have, I, I, oh, that's, what is that? Push the car. Push the car is, is, uh, is being, is persistent. Uh-huh. Is being persistent. I was thinking of incentive is angize. Mm, yeah, right? no, that's motivation. Motivation. Incentive to sort of. So it's si- similar to yeah. Pers- yeah. push the car. Push the car. Very push the car, Daram. Afain. 
I had I had some push the car with my <laughs> <laughs> with my Thai food. <laughs> the Thai food. A shout out to Fatty De Marion and York National Realty. York National is based out of Aurora, Ontario, Canada, not too far north of Toronto. The owner is a guy named Fadi De Marion. And this is a boutique real estate brokerage company that provides top tier service from first time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Farid has also made it his mission to give back to the Iranian community in the diaspora and has supported a number of Persian community events and projects. This episode of Rook is brought to you in part with some support from him and his team. Big thank you to them if you're looking for real estate. Full tier service, especially if you're in the Newmarket or Aurora area of Ontario, Canada, or anywhere in the greater Toronto area. The York National Realty Team it's where you want to go, yorknational.com, yorknational.com. All right, this Thursday, the Contemporary History of Iran, Part 3. We continue our series. Tune in for that. A uh, new episode of uh, The Regular Rook that you've just been listening to next Monday. Thank you, Captain Reza. Thank you, Groovy Shia. Keon, get better soon. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook related, including how to become a patron of this show and support us, go to rookmedia.com. There you can find our videos, previous episodes, guests, Rook funnies, Rook moments, everything there at rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist, the fabulous Keon, Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Aray Merdad, Sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms or all of them if you want. If you've not done so already, it's free to subscribe. And you can find me on Insta or Facebook at Gian Gomeshi. Thanks again for listening. And in the meantime, Mizu Bashi. Mizu Bashi.